Hello and welcome to Techno Social. So we're here with Jerry Barnett, who is the author of Porn Panic and founder of the Sex and Censorship campaign. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, so thank you for coming on the podcast. And I guess first off, what where did the book come from? Um, there's a kind of long history to it. My background's technology, mm. software technology. So I um, I was working in corporate IT. Um, in then about 93, 94, this interesting new thing popped up, the World Wide Web. Mm. Um, and um, I, so I set up a company um, offering services on, on the web, um, building sites and applications and so on. So that was kind of fairly early on in the life of the web. Um, and then it, that, it was the moment that IT got interesting because before that you were basically working in accounts, billing, telecoms, that kind of thing, government databases. From the moment the web came along, you're suddenly it's suddenly music. I, I mean, consumer facing stuff, and it became a lot more interesting. So um, I started this company, uh, got a bunch of clients. There was loads of money sloshing around in the nineties. Everyone wanted to invest in the internet. It was mm. the dot com boom, and um, <clears throat> then one of my early clients, probably about nineteen ninety six, was a guy who wanted to build a a commercial porn site. So I thought, this is fun. Um, he paid me, my company to do it. It was kind of a small, fairly simple site and it had credit card billing, which was um, pretty much the, you know, this was really cutting edge stuff. Almost no one was taking credit cards on online at the moment. So, and, and it's true, people say that porn kind of pioneered a lot of technologies and it's true, you know, the porn industry was pretty much doing everything before any any other industry was doing it. Oh. So we built this kind of simple site with kind of recurring monthly billing, people sign up. And um, as far as I know, it was the first commercial porn site to launch in the UK. Um, there were a handful in the US, there was just nothing much out there. And then this industry just kind of went crazy. I don't think anyone expected it, but it was a real, you know, for the first time in history, humans were just being given access to whatever they wanted to look at. And so the porn industry just just rocketed. Um, and then thousands and hundreds of thousands of sites started appearing through the 90s. Um, and it kind of took everyone by surprise, as I say, but it, it shouldn't have done because it, you know, it's just a measure of what, what was on everyone's mind, but we weren't talking about on the mm. internet, it made everything mm. explicit for the first time. Um, so yeah, the porn industry did very well. In 2000, the dot com crash happened. So basically all of the, the kind of, the, the fancy new ideas, virtually everything that was on the internet at that time went bust, you know. So I think Google was there by then, Amazon was there, um, eBay, um, but pr- by and large, there were loads of really silly ideas that had all launched in the late nineties. Um, and then suddenly investors got cold feet, pulled all their money out of the internet, everything crashed. And after that, it turned out that just about the only industry left you know, about 2001 was the porn industry. Uh, is that where the whole, like, 90% of the internet is porn? Yeah, it was absolutely true in those days. <clears throat> it's, it's not true anymore. You know, mm. lots of, obviously, a load of other industries have grown. But as I say, you know, I had Amazon, eBay, a bunch of interesting, um, this was before blogs, but, you know, to come in news sites, and the porn industry. And probably traffic-wise, it was 90% porn. It's probably not, not much an exaggeration. Um... And then, I mean, in, in the case of my business, we'd lost all our customers, kind of went bust, except for the one selling porn. So mm. we started focusing on pornography to kind of stay alive. Um, and then in 2004, I launched my own site. Um, I realized that there was a lot of money. I mean, it, the industry was doubling every year, literally. Mm. Um, and But it was also very unprofessional and did things very badly. And I just thought there was a way to do it better. So, um, I built a site that was kind of like Netflix. Yeah. Um, so the idea was we went to studios, we licensed, we, we got their content, we rented their titles online and paid them a, a royalty. And no one had really done this before. And there were one or two sites doing it in the US, but it was a new idea. The model up till then was that literally you'd get, it was very geeky. You get a, um, a guy who knew how to use a camera, knew how to write web pages, you know, to, to be a webmaster. So, um, 
literally people shoot their own content, edit it, publish it to their own sites, um, and then sell it and, and monetize it. There were literally one, one, one and two man operations or often run by husband and wife teams and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, that was porn kind of pre 2004, five. Then sites like mine came along, which were more professional. We didn't make our own content. We, we licensed content from studios and, and sold it or rented it. And, um, that, and it, it went really well. So I think around 2006, uh, my site was probably the, the leading site in the UK. Mm. Um, and I became very interested. I've always been politically active. So I started to become interested in the politics of, of the porn industry and sex, sexual expression and so on. And I also began to try to, started watching what the state was doing, what the government was doing. Because <clears throat> until pre-internet, the British government was the most control freakish government in Europe, uh, in the Western world, really. This government, um, like the rules for TV, radio, video, DVD were way tighter than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So, you know, porn was effectively illegal in this country. You just couldn't get it. People would hop over to Amsterdam or Hamburg and to buy DVDs and bring them back and so on. Um, and <coughs> TV was very censored, you know, swearing wasn't allowed, radio. It was all under the, the scope of media regulators, which eventually merged into one big regulator called Ofcom. Mm. And what was apparent was that Ofcom, by 2005, Ofcom was kind of, and, and not just Ofcom, the British state, the government, the, you know, the, um, probably the intelligence services and, and whatever, there was this feeling that they were losing control of media. Um, because suddenly all their laws were designed or aimed at British broadcasters, British radio um, makers, uh, and so on. As soon as the internet came along, then the content was being yeah. brought from offshore. It's no longer like locational whatsoever. You can access anything anywhere from anywhere. So yeah, and and the laws were well, laws like the Obscene Publications Act, the Broadcast Act. They all assumed that they could prosecute the either the, the, the content maker or the distributor or the broadcaster and the internet just broke all these laws. So you had a bunch of laws that applied only to British companies and then everyone just started watching porn from America, Japan, Germany, Spain, wherever, Brazil. Um, and the, the British state lost, was losing its power. And around 2005, you also had the rise of broadband internet connections. So you had the, the start of the beginning of streaming video and so you could see the internet starting to come into the TV space around that time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you could, as I say, that just watching the state's response that, you know, that there was clearly an effort beginning to start to get control of content again. Um, so that various laws were passed. Um, and uh, there was, yeah, I, um, you could see that there was lobbying going on within governments that they were making, that they were working out how to get this, this medium back under control. <coughs> it starts to affect your business. Massively, because I was, you know, basically the, the biggest porn site in the UK. Mm. And I was kind of like, you know, if there's going to be regulation, then I better be on the right side of it. So I started talking to the regulators, um, the BBFC, who were the, the British Board of Film Classification. They're the guys who put uh, certificates on DVDs and so on. They started, they introduced a program for, for websites and um, to, you know, where they would kind of put their stamp on your website and, and so on. It was all voluntary. There was no law saying what you could or couldn't do. Um, but, you know, I started lobbying and talking to them, but you could see the BBFC were, they're a private company. They're a private organization, but they have a government license to censor video so that, um, they're, um, they're the guys, they can say, they can, they're the ones who ban DVDs and so on. Mm. And the BFC's business was just falling off a cliff because they, they were all about DVDs, basically. Mm. And suddenly everyone's moving onto the internet. So the BBFC, you can see, was starting to lobby governments and, and saying, look, you know, we've done a really good job of protecting everyone, but now the internet's just spoiling everything for us. So. Um, and there were lots, there were also morality groups. So there was a big rise in the anti-sex, anti-porn feminist movement. Mm. 
um, which uh, I cover in my book to um, quite a lot. Um, so there was lobbying that this was harmful to women. There was charities were lobbying that porn was harmful to children. Um, there were the entertainment companies were lobbying because they they were worried about piracy, so they wanted ways ways to to shut down piracy. So they were kind of running false campaigns about child protection, saying that we need ways to protect children. Whereas actually, what they wanted to do was to they wanted ways to to to, get, to block pirates and so on. Mm. So all of these discussions were going on. The other thing that happened <clears throat> around two thousand and seven, I think, was the rise of free content of, of free porn. Mm. So uh, U Porn, Pornhub, and those sites appeared, and they kind of. From the, an industry point of view, they were really bad news, you know, because obviously they just kind of, you know, people stop paying for porn pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and so the industry kind of went, in, went into decline. And um, so, yeah, I started, I closed down my business in the end of 2012. Um, and then I'd become interested in the politics and I'd become very concerned that actually there was there were moves behind the scenes to introduce a Chinese style censorship system. Um, and they weren't presenting it as that, that what they were doing was just these endless campaigns about children looking at porn, it's harming children. There were moral panic after moral panic. So there would be suddenly it would be all over the newspapers that, you know, 50% of nine year olds have watched porn or something that yeah. you know, it's kind of made up numbers, but designed to scare people. And they would of course be, you know, they would make headlines. Um, and then, yeah, as I say, there was also this kind of very pernicious feminist movement going on, um, saying that, you know, it's harmful to women, it objectifies women. Um, and again, that was kind of within the political class, um, especially on, on the left, on the labor side and so on that, you know, a lot of people went for that kind of argument. So there's this general feeling that porn is new. It was new in the UK, really. And it's bad, and we don't know how, what effect it's going to have on people. And if we don't do something now, we're going to have, um, you know, a, a nation of we're going to be raising a nation of rapists, and you know, all of this scare stuff. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, I just I became interested in, in in all of this politics, and I started the sex and censorship campaign. Started writing my book, which was published in two thousand and sixteen, really to kind of look at um, <clears throat> all of these trends. Um, and to raise the the flag, to raise the warning flag that this isn't about pornography. What they're doing is is getting their claws into the internet because the internet had come from nowhere. It wasn't a government-approved <clears throat> thing. It was it was a piece of technology that just had spread out of uh, the west coast of America and, and become popular. Um, so so yeah. Uh, um, and by the, it became increasingly clear that the regulators and the government were looking at ways to legislate. Um, and eventually they passed the, what was it, the 2017 Digital Economy Act, yeah. which said, basically said, um, if you're a porn site publisher, um, you need to verify the ages of your visitors, which sounds reasonable, but it's actually very hard to do that. Uh, yeah, it's very expensive to do. There's a lot of sites that <clears throat> even ages ago would have like verify that you're 18 before entering and you just yeah. click the thing and <clears> said <throat> I am 18 and it's like well anyone who can click a mouse can click that button like it Yeah, doesn't, I mean doesn't that, that mean was just to cover themselves and <clears throat> one of the stories that went around was that people were just accidentally looking at porn, you know, so Obviously, no one was accidentally looking at porn, but you know they put these they put these pages up just to show that they're responsible. You know, if you mm -hmm. don't want to look at porn, click the back button now. Yeah. Kind of um, but the government obviously said this isn't good enough. What you, you need to actually verify the age of the person before you let them into the site, mm -hmm. um, which is a, an, an expensive and difficult thing to do. That's kind of that's the bit of the law that everyone's focused on: the age verification part. The, what's more interesting to me is the other part of the law that says if a site doesn't comply to this, uh -huh. it can be blocked by the by the by the government, basically. Um, and the way the law actually works is it it makes the ISPs liable. So the ISPs have to block sites on the government on the official block list. Yeah. If they don't, then the ISPs can be prosecuted. 
So um, they spent about two years putting that into in place, putting the systems in place, and it's going to launch in mid-July. Um, so from mid-July, there'll be a censorship system, and basically the BBFC can say um, this list of sites doesn't, a porn sites doesn't comply with UK law, so they go on the blacklist, mm. and then ISPs will be obliged to block them. Um, and that's going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be interesting. Like for the first time, people people are certain, really unaware of this, and I, I kind of know because I've been talking to journalists for years. Mm. Um, everyone, most people are unaware of what's about to happen. Right, like I know something's going on with porn in the government, and that's about as much as I could articulate about it. Yeah, and there have been a series of measures going back probably nine years, a series of different laws trying to rain porn in one way or the other. So people, you know, there's always a story about, you know, David Cameron or whoever's prime minister at the time trying to protect children from porn. Mm. They brought in actually a series of laws. But this is the big one. Mm. So to get a bit onto the sort of technical side, um, <clears throat> I think a good example would be the UK government has been involved in a, um, you know, effort to try and block access to uh, the Pirate Bay, which is a site that, mm. you know, is obviously used by many, many different people for many different reasons. I used to use it a lot for pirating um, video games back when I was younger, just because, you know, I was like 16, I didn't have any money, and if I wanted to play a video game, that was really yeah, the only way it was, was going to happen. And, um, yeah, you probably shouldn't name the games, otherwise then the publishers will know, they'll know they can publish you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, but, um, you know, now it is ostensibly blocked in Britain, but yeah. A, you know, you can obviously access it using Tor, yeah. and you could obviously access it if you have any VPN that lets you have your sort of node be in another country. Yeah. But, you know, beyond that, like, you just have to Google, like, UK Pirate Bay, and you'll get, like, sites that have a built-in proxy on them already, yeah. so that you can... it. It is just the Pirate Bay, even though it's illegal in this country, even though the, the if you typed in the site itself, it would be like, nope, ISP is not going to take you there. There's all these other sites that just put like just a layer of, of proxy between between the ISP and the site, so the ISP doesn't know what's going on. So at least, you know, in that case, it is banned, but it, it's not banned. Like anyone with a shred of determination who wants to access the Pirate Bay can get there. Like is... Is is this current legislation going to be any more effective than that in actually preventing people who really want access to porn and really can't don't want to verify their age? Um, somewhat. I, th I think the reality is that the blocking technology is just going to get better and better. <coughs> so, uh, but you're right. The pirate bay. The, the main problem with blocking the pirate bay wasn't technical; it was legal. That the I think it was, I'm trying to remember who took the prosecutions, it, it would be like the big studios like Universal or Warner or whoever mm. would take, um, would go, have to go to High Court and say, here's a list of Pirate Bay URLs. This is what actually happened about 10 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, so they, and the court would say, yeah, these sites are breaking the law, they can be blocked. So there'd be, you know, 20 URLs would be blocked. So the ISPs would then get a court order saying you have to block these URLs. And then five minutes later, Pirate Bay appears on 20 different URLs. So, mm. and then they have to go back to court again, which costs another hundred grand. So it's kind of, the system didn't really work. And that gives you a clue as to why this new system's coming in. Because the new system doesn't require you to go to court. You can it, literally, the BBFC will decide if the site breaks the, breaks UK law, then they'll add it to the list. And there's no going to court. There's no long round trips. Mm. Um, so that's kind of one of the things they've changed is just the ability to move move fast and just kind of you know if, if another hundred proxies come up they can whack another hundred they can they can put them on the block list as fast as they appear kind of thing mm. um, that doesn't mean you can't get around it so one of the issues as you said is VPNs um, the the law specifically only applies to British people so the idea is say Pornhub will say it will do a, a, a um, a geo detect and they'll say if you're in the UK um, they'll they have they'll ask you to verify your age and if you're not they won't ask you so the obvious thing to do and what everyone should do is install a VPN um, set your location to America the US or whatever and then nothing will change mm. um, so what we're looking at is an arms race as usual so um, you know the censorship 
is kind of the technology. The technology is there; they can block stuff. But it is the the, the technology, the um, uh, the kind of uh, the legal side, uh, and and then the, the countered with the, um, the the kind of anti censorship technology. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things that's likely to happen that's been again, the government's talked about it. I don't know how likely or how close is that they'll do what China's done with VPNs, which is you can't sell your VPN in the UK unless it complies with UK law, and that includes not and that includes not allowing access to these to, to UK customers to access our list of sites. Uh-huh. Um, so again, they, that's talk, been talked about. I've no idea how feasible that is. Yeah, well, hopefully that's likely to happen. And the other thing they can do is also they they go after they go to the credit card providers. So if a site's running outside the UK. Um, and selling uh, and not conforming to UK law, they could not only um, have it blocked, but they could go to Visa and Mastercard and say this site's in breach of UK law, and they'll have their they'll lose their credit card processing, oh. um, or uh, so, or at least they won't be allowed to process UK cards. So they're kind of yeah. I mean, at the moment, it's, it's if you know how to install a VPN or use Tor, it won't affect you. Um, mm. But it, that doesn't apply to ninety percent of people. Ninety yeah. percent of people will just log on on July the fifteenth, go to Pornhub, I see uh, a, a, a demand. They verify their age. Mm-hmm. They'll go to their favorite porn site, and it will be blocked. So um, because it it doesn't conform to to UK law, um, and the problem with this stuff, yeah, however easy it is to work around, the bulk of the Brit of the public. <clears throat> don't know how to do it or they're worried they'll be breaking the law so they won't do it mm. so they'll most people will conform um, so yeah this is just the start really yeah. mm. but how will they be asking people to verify their age yeah. they've um, they haven't exactly specified but they, they basically they've left it to third parties mm. to provide solutions and then and then they'll approve these solutions um, so you have to provide a credit card. You can there. There are lots of systems out there. There are kind of passport scan, driving license scan. Um, there are anonymous over the counter cards, so you can go in a shop. They can do an age check. You know, just a, a face check, and like they do with alcohol or something, mm. and um, and send you a card if you look over eighteen. Then you can use the card. So you know that's at least anonymous. Um, I think there are AI based ones that you can. Look at your Facebook account and decide. You know, if you've had your Facebook account ten years, then you probably, you know, and they can look at your interests and your friends and. That yeah, thing. that's very Orwellian kind yeah. of that one. Like, yeah, I mean, <coughs> people happily grant access to their their Facebook. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I think the over the counter card might be quite popular, and the and credit card. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, if it's a credit card, then. Teenagers will just nick their parents', parents credit, credit card. Cards. Yeah. Mm. So it's very easy to get through. Um, it doesn't. It's not going to do the job of protecting teenagers because they're going to be the first ones to break the system. Mm. It's going to um, what it do is, is it will block adults. Um, but yeah, as I say, the porn industry is quite excited about this as well. I mean, the porn industry actually likes this on the whole because um, ten years ago, the or twelve years ago. All the free porn came along and, and broke everyone's businesses. Mm. And the idea here is that you won't be able to just go onto a free site anymore. Um, and so I think the porn industry is hoping that people start paying for porn again. Yeah. Um, so they've been kind of supportive uh, of, of this move. <laughs> so one of the points you made was that this is being sold as kind of about, about porn, but yeah. you think it's actually something deeper than that. Yeah. And the porn is, I think before we started the podcast, you used the phrase canary in the coal mine. Yeah. Could you explain a bit about what that means? Yeah. I think if you're going to, uh, as I said before, the British government, 10 years ago, the British government was kind of wagging its finger at China and saying, you shouldn't censor the internet, kind of join us in the free world. And, you know, um, and that was the, say, so yeah, the Tory, the Tory um, Lib Dem coalition government was still in that kind of position that Britain is is a free country and that we export our values of freedom to the world. Um, and then it kind of, 
the, the point is, if if you go around telling people, if if you say censorship is bad, and you go around telling people that censorship is bad, um, and that you as a nation are opposed to it, you can't then suddenly say we're going to censor the internet. So you know, it, the, the government's never said they're going to censor the internet. What they do is say they're going to protect children from porn um, mm. and uh, and introduce a safe verification program. Um, so if you look at it from the state's point of view, if you wanted to censor the internet, um, how would you go about it without anyone noticing and without Amnesty International and um, the civil liberties organisations and, um, and and so on, and the press really, really kind of getting wind of it. So, um, for example, I, I talked to, been talking to a, a good journalist at The Guardian for a long time, who's mm. quite interested in all this. And every time he goes and pitches to his editor, you know, say, this is a, this is a civil liberties issue here. The editor will kind of glance at it and go, you know, it's, it's just a child protection scheme. It's not a big story. And so it hasn't really appeared in the press because the gov- because of what the government's done in, in selling it as um, a child protection system. So to me, the, the, the clever and dangerous part is that on July the 15th, what we'll have is a, an, a censorship system. And, I, and as I said, porn is the beta test. Um, and, you know, you can guarantee that piracy will be next on the list. You know, yeah, There obviously. will be an amendment to the Digital Economies Act, Digital Economy Act, and it will almost certainly include piracy. That will be number two. It may include hate speech, stroke offensive speech, which to me is very worrying because that's that's a kind of a blanket of censorship that's a, that's, that's that's smothering everything at the moment. Who defines what is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah like, the, the state starts to define it, and as we've mm. seen over the last few years with Facebook, you know the. the the bar started here and now it's here and literally I just every day a friend of mine is, is returning from a he say, Hey guys, I've been banned for thirty days, whatever. People are banned on Facebook all the time. Mostly yeah. for sexual content, but often for what for what's called hate speech yeah. um, or offensive speech or, or whatever. Imagine the laws of Facebook suddenly applying to every blog and, and every news site and every, every, every the, the entire internet. Oh, that's the most worrying bit uh-huh. to me. I've been mm. barred from Facebook three times. <laughs> what for? Um, all, all through a hate speech. Mm. Um, twice I posted an anti-racist post, but they didn't, the censor didn't get that it was a, like, they didn't understand it. So yeah. I may, I posted oh it. You know, if you take, if you post something taking the piss out of racists, or, you know, Tommy Robinson's the greatest man in the world, lol, or something. Yeah. The censor might look at it and go, oh, he's saying Tommy Robinson's great, block, or, you know. So yeah, sarcasm if, doesn't really come <coughs> across at all on the internet a lot no. of the time. <laughs> and, you know, racism is a good example of how this goes, because the way that hate speech laws have gone, uh, it's, it's now reached the extent that not only do racists get blocked, but anti-racists also get blocked, because discussion of race of racism often looks like racism or it may offend someone or, or it may be satirical or whatever. So we end up with the state taking control of this conversation and this kind of nice idea that if we ban all discussion of this matter, then it won't be a problem anymore. You know, we're, we're getting to that 1984 mm. type thing where the big brother knows what's best. Mm. Um, oh yeah. The, th- the third time I got blocked was actually, it was, um, the, the post was classed as misogyny and actually what, what had happened was I actually a friend of mine who's a, a, a woman posted something like all oh, women are crazy or something like that. I'm, I think she was drunk, decided, you know, all oh, women are crazy, ha ha, posted that. She got, but she got the post taken down. So her post was, was classed as hate speech <laughs> and taken down. So she screenshotted the thing saying, the, you know, this breaches our community standards. And I then shared the post, including her screenshot of her original post, to my page, which is about censorship, and said, um, you know, this woman's just been barred for saying all women are crazy, just been, had a post from me for saying all women are crazy. And then I got a five-day ban for reposting her post. Oh, so, okay. You know, so the fact was, it was never re- remotely like hate speech in the first place. And it certainly wasn't hate speech when I posted about her being banned, but I but then I was banned for five days for hate speech. 
and that show I mean hate speech is such a ludicrously vague and vague term that it can be used to take down anything um, and that's you know so I'm sure that's coming um, because you know the state people are getting arrested for hate speech on a daily basis now um, but yeah, under the guise of hate speech, you can sense a discussion of anything political at all, really. <clears throat> so, like, um, to sort of return the discussion a bit back to sort of, like, porn, and, like, the sort of how the moral panic around porn is kind of being used as the whole, like, oh, no, like, we're not building a system to basically just control what content is and isn't available on the internet. We're building a system to protect children from porn. Yeah. Um, like, <clears throat> you know, why is it, I think, you know, it's kind of obvious to a lot of us why, oh, you know, porn is bad for children. But if you kind of think it through, like, it's sort of ludicrous to expect an 11 year old boy to do anything else than look for porn on the internet, because like, that's sort of, I mean, that's that's sort of the biologically hardwired to do when they hit puberty. Like, yeah. Um, uh, so you know, is it a specifically British thing? This sort of <laughs> panic around around porn, and is it is it is it something that maybe might subside, or is this going to be sort of a continuing source of social sort of outrage? Well, the, I'm not sure it's deep in the British culture, but it's deep in the British state. The British state has always felt that it has the right to stop people to get porn. So I mean, to this day. Hardcore porn is, is banned on TV. It's never been allowed on TV. Mm -hmm. We're about the only Western country where hardcore porn isn't allowed on TV. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's deep in, in British history. And, and it was only the internet, really, that brought porn legally into the UK because you couldn't l legally buy it before that. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, there, yeah, there's this general perception that... And, I think a lot of countries have this kind of panic around children and stuff, but Britain and America are generally the worst. Mm. Um, you know, America has a big religious lobby. The other, the other, but in America, they have the First Amendment, which protects free speech. So even though you do get these panics in the, in the US, or you get this kind of disapproval of porn, you, it doesn't get blocked. It doesn't. Censorship is is a no no there because it's it's banned in the constitution. We don't have any bans, or we don't have any any kind of free speech protection really in the UK. Not um, there is actually in in the Human Rights Act, but that came in. That was part of EU legislation, so we might lose that. Mm, you know. And plus, Parliament <laughs> in the UK is technically sovereign, so as in like literally sovereign, so Parliament can change any law; they can do anything. And the the rulings of the Supreme Court in the UK are in a very like the the Parliament tends to go with whatever the Supreme Court says, but they are actually technically advisory. The Supreme Court, if Parliament just says, like, actually, no, we're going to pass this law anyway, there's no legal power the Supreme Court has to yeah, prevent the passage um, of a law. I mean, there are some EU protections. So, for example, EU, um, the net neutrality rules um, mm -hmm. disallow, disallow blocking of, of websites. And, and, you know, the EU has this basic idea that the free trade between countries and, and so on, and, and in particular net neutrality. So in theory, um, a blocking law in one, one EU country could be challenged um, as, as breaking net neutrality. So leaving the EU is kind of a prerequisite um, because it would be a lot harder for the British government to censor the internet if we were still in the EU. Having said that, the whole of the EU is getting a lot more nationalistic and conservative, so mm. it might be coming there anyway. But mm. certainly, you know, the UK is, the UK would like to go back to the 70s when none of that bad stuff kind of crossed our borders. Um, uh, yeah, um, but it, yeah, it's a particularly British thing. And as far as the moral panic about children goes, I mean, people, you know, people don't want look, kids looking at porn. But on the other hand, what does that, that mean? As you say, kid pre-puberty, they don't really look for it or find it. And you can install filters and that kind of thing. Post, you know, puberty and um, say 13 or whatever the age. At 13, I've got a small child and he's got a Google account and Google mm. has automatic protections on Android devices, um, which they, they remove the protections when the child hits 13, which I think is, is pretty cool. So basically control freak parents can't use Google's system to control what a 13, 14, 15 year old does and I think it's wrong to do that because oh. um, they kind of they have some rights mm. even though they're not they're not fully adult then 
Um, but the other thing is the evidence really doesn't demonstrate that the porn is harmful to teenagers. People might not like the idea that teenagers look at porn, um, but there isn't any evidence to suggest it's harmful. And so a lot of the start, I, I devote a chapter in the book to, to this, to just looking at the evidence around porn and harm. And actually, not only is there no evidence to support all these claims that are made all the time, the evidence seems to go the other way, that actually the more sexual liberty you have, the more permissive, the more the earlier children get access to to explore things on their own, the less likely that then the lower the, the sexual violence rate for rate sexual violence rate falls, the better sexually educated people are. Um uh. and so on. So the evidence is that the more porn is available, the more easily porn's available to teenagers, the lower the sexual violence rate goes. And that kind of makes sense to me, but most people think it's the opposite way that, that kind of and especially if you listen to the, the, the panickers, the porn panic mm. people, they'll tell you that, oh my God, you know, if children are watching porn at 13, then they're going to be off um, raping each other and, mm. and, and this kind of thing. I mean, one thing I have experienced, and this is from personal experience, is that porn can be incredibly addictive. And I'm, I'm someone who actually has had to go into a addiction recovery program for the way that I was using pornography. And I spent a lot of time now in recovery meeting other guys who have been completely addicted to it. it because I think it can become just like a drug and a way of escaping. It become, it became for me and many other people actually not sexual at all. It's yeah. an escape tool. Um, and I'm really trying to work it, puzzle together like, is there a degree of protection that should be in place to stop people like me when I was 13 and I happened to have a particularly kind of troubled teenage years and I found porn as a way of escaping mm -hmm. and then did a lot of damage and kind of stunted my healthy sexual development as, as a result and now I'm kind of working on that. I've cut it out of my life completely. But I don't believe the right answer is to say nobody should watch porn and I don't think the government should be telling people what is and isn't right. Yeah. But I feel like they're there should be some kind of middle ground. I don't know if it's kind of parents just actually taking the time to have conversations with their children about porn and about sexuality. Um, I wonder what are your thoughts on... Yeah, um, I mean, it would be nice if parents do, but you, mm. you can't rely on parents to do that. So one part of the answer is better sex ed from a much younger age. You know, uh, Britain is terrible at this compared to most of Europe. Oh. Um, so, you know, children can be shown... In Germany, you can be shown hardcore videos. You know, how can you... Sex is the only thing you're supposed to learn about without being able to see it, without looking at it, mm. which doesn't make any sense. Mm. So in Germany, children are shown explicit videos of sex. You know, they're not porn, they're made for education. But this is the kind of thing that Brit would freak out the British people and culture. Um, so part of it is sex education from an earlier age. The whole sex, uh, porn addiction, sex addiction thing is... is um, interesting and complex because part of what there, there are a bunch of things there first of all part of that is just normal healthy behavior you know people that um people um for want of a not to be euph euphemistic about it kids seems want to masturbate mm. and porn helps them do that and that's normal and people have different levels of sex drive so some behavior that might be seen as bad is actually pretty normal but on top of that, yeah, there are, there is compulsion, and people can latch onto it, as you say, like as they cannot they cannot do anything to get it to to as a as an escape, as they might with drugs or with um oh kind of plenty of stuff you know alcohol sh or shopping yeah, or shopping and that kind of thing. Um, now there's a big debate over whether porn addiction exists at all. You know, so mm. that, uh, this is in the in psychology circles. I think you have to get your language right and this isn't something I'm an expert about particularly but there is a big debate about whether this is addiction at all because addiction typically originally referred to, to chemicals which are physically addictive mm. so your, your body is physically tuned so alcohol and heroin and nicotine are genuinely addictive whether something more virtual than that is is addictive is questionable or, you know, so there's a difference between compulsive behaviors and an, an actual addiction. And, and there is, there's an argument about that terminology. Yeah. Um, and there's a really good, um, there's a guy called, um, David Lay, Dr. David Lay, yeah. a psychologist who specializes on in this stuff in the U S 
And um, he and his colleagues are, are very much of the opinion that sex addiction and porn addiction um, are mythical. Um, that th these are not that, and again, not that there aren't difficult behaviours, mm. um, but, but that you shouldn't call it addiction mm. because it's kind of, then people go, it's like heroin, so we need to ban it. Kind of, you know, like, would you give kids heroin, then why should you let them watch porn? Or, you know, so it's used to, to blur to blur the discussion. Mm. Um, and um, I can't remember where I was going. But, but yeah, Dr. Uh, David Lee wrote this a book called, I think, The Myth of Sex Addiction. And he mm. points out the things like, you know, so it's not just porn, it's about, um, if you remember Tiger Woods, um, he was found to be having affair, affairs with like a dozen porn stars and he lost all his sponsorship and then he went into rehab and said he declared he had sex addiction and he was being cured and then he came out cured and then he got his sponsorships back and stuff. So sex addiction is often used as a, a cover for what's perfectly hu normal human behaviour. Mm. The fact is if you have a high sex drive and you're a multi-millionaire celebrity, you're going to be bombarded with offers of sex and some people... Will, will take them. That mm. doesn't mean that you have a problem. I mean, it means you have a problem if you lie to your wife. But I mean, in my experience and from what I've seen, it is very real and it crosses that boundary from being something that is done with a degree of control to just being obsessive and being yeah. there's no way of stopping. Yeah. And people going to actually need all sorts of crazy lengths to try and stop self-harm or throwing laptops away and still going back to it. Um, yeah. You could, and the same behaviours were associated with, say, homosexuality when it was less mm. acceptable. So, again, as I said, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff in here, part of which is normal sexual behaviour, but which has always been stigmatised. And, you know, back in the day, all masturbation was seen as sinful and wrong mm. and things. So, you know, the question is how much of that is your normal sex drive and how much of it is compulsive behaviour mm. uh, and so on. But, you know, um, there's no doubt, before the internet, gay people in kind of small towns and conservative places were often committing suicide, self-harming and, you know, or trying to, you know, trying to do it, trying to get cured and that kind of thing. Um, and now we accept that actually homosexuality doesn't need curing. I'm not saying that that's different from a, a compulsive behaviour that's distressing. Well, it's, it's a behaviour that was distressing themselves and they couldn't stop themselves doing it. Mm. Um, but, um, um, but I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, you know, absolutely it can be problematic. I mean, part of the question as well is if you block it, I think it would be worse if you somehow managed to stop everyone looking at any of it until they're 18. Mm. Because having seen what happened when the internet arrived in, 19, in the early mid 90s, all of us, you know, I was 30 in 1995. I got obsessed with porn. I'd never, you know, we, we just threw ourselves in and we dived in and, and, and kind of reveled in it because this was a brand new thing. Um, and so re regardless of what age, it, you know, you were when the internet, when, when in 1995, um, you, you like, we'd been starved of this and we, um, and we kind of often got compulsive and, and looked at, uh, at a lot of it. Um, mm. And so on, whereas today, it's going to be 11, 12, 13, because the internet's already here. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah. so regardless of what the solution to the problem is, blocking it till 18 would probably make it worse, I think, because um, you're then, you're just suddenly opening the, the, this kind of door to something that people that have no experience with. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely, I'm sure, you know, therapy and... Uh, um, I'm sure you know, know like, yeah. more about the experience. Well, I think one of the things that is observable <clears throat> is that it's a lot of the people as addicts, as you might imagine, are people very much kind of in a lot of psychological distress and pain and may be kind of at the bottom of the social ladder and finding it very difficult to find relationships and yeah. kind of live what we might consider a normal adult human life. And so they kind of, well, we turn to these things as a, uh, as an escape and an antidote and a sort of a surrogate for the real thing. Yeah, for sure. And it, yeah, working out how it fits with you and understanding it is going to be difficult at any time. But when you're 13, you don't understand how it's affecting you or how it's not affecting you. You know, I mean, I, mm. I, 
I didn't have my f uh, first sexual relationship until I was 17. Um, but, you know, I, I had sex for the first, when I first had sex, I had never seen a porn video of any kind. So, I, in other words, I'd never seen anyone having sex until I had sex. That's really weird to me today. I don't mm. think that's healthy. Um, but, um, but, yeah, the way you respond to stuff is, is down to a load of, of individual things. And, uh, yeah, it, it's similar to drugs and alcohol in that 90% of people who use, you, you know, 90% of drug users don't, aren't problematic. Right. And then 10% are, and that comes down to a bunch of stuff, including genetic and... Um, and their, their own, their own upbringing and societal and this is why I think it comes back it's actually a bigger societal problem probably really that people become addicted to various things because they are not integrated in communities that can support them as well yeah I mean there are, there are broader things again gaming um, and again I'm, I'm not sure if gaming is actually addictive but certainly people are drawn into it compulsively maybe just because it's better than their real day to day mm. lives. Um, um, and I think that actually is kind of a good analogy because, like, <clears throat> like you know, as someone who's, I went through a period of playing loads and loads of video games and having been through that, kind of when I look at it, it's like, was the problem the video games? Like, if I had had all the video games taken away, would that have cured me? No, I would have just found something else to do because the reason I was playing video games wasn't because, I mean, at least in my case, and I know there's you know, a world of people out there who will been through similar stuff for different reasons but at least in my case it was just because like I had nothing better to do like I didn't you know I not that, not that I didn't have friends in school but I didn't have like um, a huge community outside a community outside of school that I really did much stuff with so I had loads and loads of free time in which I just kind of felt lonely and it's like oh well if I sit in front of a screen and play video games and distract myself I don't feel lonely mm -hmm. and so like you can take away the video games but you know, the problem which is the loneliness is still there you haven't actually solved anything and I would have probably just gone on to find some other you know, thing to fill the hole. And so, you know, to bring that back to porn, I think, you know, it, you know, it, these things like video games, like porn, like drugs, that can have an incredibly negative effect. If you can, you, if you can see with the war on drugs, like, it doesn't stop people taking drugs to make all the drugs illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there's a strong case to be made that actually the war on drugs has made the whole drug situation worse because it's turned it into an underground culture that gets ignored, that gets perceived incorrectly, and that, you know, people's bad attitudes towards it as a result of this actually aggravate the problem. They don't help to solve it. And I think I think the same is almost certainly true, like, with porn. Like, if we, if we get rid of the porn, you know, there will probably be a downtick in terms of people who have serious issues with porn. But there's not going to be a downtick in people who have those kinds of serious issues. They'll just yeah, find something I mean, else. The other thing is, I mean, sex is so fundamentally <clears throat> rooted into our psyche mm. um, that if you take away the porn, as, as I say, I mean, the the figures are pretty stark. It, it looks like the, the best figures are in the US regarding sexual violence because mm -hmm. the FBI um, gathers really good stats and you can compare year year by year and that kind of thing. From Something like, I think, the late 70s till the mid-2000s, the sexual violence rate in America fell by about 85%. Um, and that's really significant. You know, this, mm. is, this isn't marginal. And it's, it's believed that this is pretty much entirely due to porn, and particularly porn access in the 15 to 19 age group. So the question is, if you take porn away from 15 to 19-year-olds who are just full of hormones... Um, sex hormones and also fight hormones and stuff. You know, I mean, if, if, you know, if porn provided an outlet and mm. whether, you know, the downside of that is a lot of 15 to 19 year olds who are sitting there looking at a lot of porn, that might be problematic in its own way. The upside to them sitting there doing that is that they weren't, they were committing less sexual violence and probably less violence in general. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a shift in society and we need to understand the implications. But one of the problems in the discussion about porn and drugs is that no one ever says, what are the pluses and minuses of drugs or porn? They mm. say, what, what are the harms and what can we do about it? So they identify the negative sides, which you've identified there are negative sides, and ignore the positive sides. Mm. I said, I was on talk radio recently and um, I said, you know, I, I, I said, you know, regardless of whether you think it's good or bad, a 13 year old is looking at porn and there are pros and cons. Um, do we as adults have the right to tell a 13 year old they can't look at porn? 
Mm. And of course, the presenter said, "So you're saying that children should look at porn, are you?" And, and then <laughs> and they, and they tweeted about me and stuff. And but it's kind of, um, but you know, it, it's it's a question of whether we have the right to to intervene or to oh, intervene yeah. in that way. But yeah, I mean, people need need help and they need services. But yeah, drugs. We know drugs. Legal drugs are safer than illegal drugs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because you know, you know what you're buying. You're buying, and then also, you know, the classic argument is during prohibition, alcohol got stronger. Beer disappeared, and everyone started drinking bourbon during prohibition because and so you couldn't get ethanol, and they, they sold methanol. Which yeah, you and you know, yeah. literally, but because you can smuggle a barrel of beer, you can smuggle a barrel of bourbon. Bourbon's with five times as much, you get the same amount of time in prison. Mm, and same and like with cannabis, and the, you know, the yeah. shift from, in the nineties was a shift from old school, grown outdoors cannabis to skunk. Mm. Um, and it, the whole reason was you, there's more drug in a smaller space, so it's, it's easier to, you know, yeah, it's so, easier to, to, to fit into small spaces, basically. Yeah, I guess it would be interesting that if the UK really succeeds in implementing very draconian porn laws, if we might see sort of the porn that was available sort of, you know, increase in kind of like sort of like how hardcore it was and an increase in kind of sort of the more extreme sort of, the popularity of the more sort of extreme like um, uh, forms of porn out there, especially like I guess you know the really obvious one would just be like an increase in like sort of hardcore BDSM porn as a result of it being sort of harder to access, meaning that people who want to access it then start looking for sort of a stronger hit, so to speak. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, um, about the yeah. There's there's the idea that you kind of have this go for stronger and stronger stuff. I'm not sure whether that, how true that is or not. Um, mm. I think people typically search for what is their thing and then mm. go to that and some people like, like BDSM. But yeah, you're right. I mean, basically, if people are going on tour to access legal porn, then they're suddenly going to be looking at sites that list legal and illegal stuff together. Mm. Um, it doesn't make sense. You know, and... and the state is fully aware that they're pushing people onto tour by doing this, mm. um, and that doesn't seem good. You know, if you if you want to, um, if you if you want to deal with if if you're kind of classing anyone who uses tour as problematic, you know, they're buying drugs or they're pirating content or whatever, then the last thing you want to do is add another is, is persuade another couple of million people to start using tour because you're then effectively moving another slice of society into that criminal camp and oh. it, again it's back to the drug criminalization thing that whole discussion of you know if people want to buy weed then why are you making them go to a guy who also sells coke you know um, if, if you know rather yeah. than just sell, sell weed in a local, the um, local store. coffee shop and then they'd be less inclined to go and buy coke as well or whatever mm. Mm. so we've got about five minutes left or so got a couple more questions um one i'm just thinking so like societies for a long time had a particular relationship with sex and we might kind of consider that traditional monogamy and then the 60s happened and clearly there's a sexual revolution sexual expression a lot changed and then we kind of had the digital revolution as well now which again has opened up a lot of new sexual energy i suppose in society but what would a healthy and mature sexual society look like um that's really interesting i write a lot about this i've written for recently for um i wrote an article for ario magazine on mm. monogamy um, but i'm fascinated with the the biology and culture of this because it obviously is very much driven by human biology um but there are contradictions kind of from my perspective because on the one hand i'm very much pro sexual freedom and people making their own choices on the other hand there are good reasons why society enforced monogamy in the past, and that comes back to, I and mean, basically, um, there are few, if, in monogamous societies you have fewer single men, you have more men with, who are attached and have children, who are then obliged, who then who then have an incentive to go out and, and work for and to feed their families and so on. So monogamous societies are less are known to be less violent than traditional polygamous or, or promiscuous societies, um, but on the other hand, I think you know, people should be allowed to be promiscuous and should be allowed to be polygamous if they want. You know, there, there should be no stigma. If you take away 
monogamy is basically enforced by stigmatizing it. So, you know, typically in monogamous societies, then girls are stigmatized for being, if you're still single, if you haven't got a ring on your finger by the time you're 21 or 25 or whatever, there's something wrong with you. So, in, you know, that's not, that's not nice and that's not very healthy, but it does, it does reduce um, violence in society. Um, so there's a potential problem if you believe in sexual freedom, you, you're also accepting that a proportion of men are going to be going, um, are going to be going without sex or without relationships. Um, the, the way human sexuality works is that women choose mates. So w women will typically, women are quite picky, they're pickier than men. Women will t would rather be in polygamous relationships with a good-looking, high-ranking, high-status male than, um, than, than with someone who's lower status. So if you completely liberalise sexuality, um, it will always go back to the point where a minority of men are getting laid and having and getting a lot more women than, than the rest than the rest of men. This has histor historically been a problem, and it's a problem of human biology. Um, Is that why we have far more female ancestors than male ancestors? Um, yeah, I mean, there was there there are all sorts of interesting studies. There's a genetic study from about I think it going back a few thousand years in the Middle East to the the, the point where kings were rising, and as kings rose, then fewer and fewer men took more and more wives, and so there were more and more men excluded from the from the mating game kind of thing. Mm. And at one point in 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 our recent well in in the past few thousand years. It's estimated that there were 17, I think 17, uh, men were 17 times less likely to have children than women. Um, mm. So not, obviously the men who were having children were having a hundred or so, you know, but um, because they, they were kings. But um, so that's kind of, that's our, that's our natural, our natural state. Um, and it's not necessarily very, very healthy. On the other hand, there are, Sex is often used because we're bored. You know, we our ancestors were very, very bored. You know, I was really bored. I, I grew up in the seventies. It was boring as hell. I couldn't, I can't even remember how we got by day to day as children because you know we had even children's TV was on like three hours a day or something. There was no, we had no videos, no internet, no get computer games, mm. and so on. So I can't actually remember. And I talked to my friends about it. We can't remember how we survived. You know? <laughs> um, and you go further back. I mean, our, our, our traditional human state is sheer, utter boredom. And sex filled a lot of that. So actually sex is becoming less important. And it's bound to become less important. Um, so that's probably a good thing, you know, e even though, again, we, we don't want to um, restrict sexual freedom. If people voluntarily have less sex, which is what seems to be happening in Western societies in Japan and Korea and so on, then that might be a good thing. It might be, you know, we simply just don't need it as much as we, we used to because mm. we've got gaming or gym or what you know, whatever, all these outlets that we didn't have before. Um, the other thing is the rise of sex robots and, and so on, and that's, I think, bound to be significant because effectively that automates the traditional female role and it, and it create and it, that's, the one thing that if sex robots get good enough, that can cr correct the imbalance that's been in in our nature throughout our whole history, where mm. where there are always more men. There are there are too many men, basically. I think that was the way I wrote it, put it in the, the Ario mm. article. Um, biology has has left us in this mess where there are too many men, and that creates a lot of problems in society. Um, sex robots could be one of the the fixes to that. Hmm. I think there's one more question that we ask all of our guests actually, which is what would you say to to people, especially young people, about the future? What advice would you give them if you could give some yeah. advice? I mean, I generally, I'd, I'd say, I, I'm, in cultural terms, I'm very optimistic. And mm. so I'd say, you know, avoid, like, ignore panics on the whole. When you hear that things on, things were better in the old days, 99% of the time that is not true. You know, things were not better in the old days. And yet you hear it. Every generation's heard the same thing. Um, growing up, the things are getting, things used to be better, things are getting worse. Um, so in general, culturally, things are getting worse. You know, I think 
we're less violent, we're nicer to each other, we're more empathetic, there's less hunger, all of that kind of stuff. That doesn't, you know, but there's a load of scary stuff like climate change that might screw all that up. But, um, so in general, I'd, I'd say, you know, young people need to, yeah, learn from history, but not be too driven by people telling them their behaviours are problematic or, or anything. Mm. Mm. Cool. Wow, that's a good and interesting advice. Um, thank you for coming on the show. It's been super interesting talking to you. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> Cheers. It's, um, it's been great. Is there anything you want to plug at all? Uh, I might as well mention my book again, <laughs> Porn Panic, uh, the blog, which is a little bit idle at the moment, but um, it's sexandcensorship.org. Um, and then, yeah, you can Google. Uh, I, I'm Porn Panic on Twitter as well, and, my, and I have a, a, a fes- Facebook page called Sex and Censorship. Um, but, yeah, I think things are going to get pretty interesting in the next month with mm. censorship and so on. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I'll be tuning in to see what you have to say about it. Thanks. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, and see you guys in the next episode of Techno Social. <laughs>